welcome you all to worship uh, this Sunday. It was a great day yesterday. I loved it. Finally got a little warmth. Doesn't look like we're going to get it next week, though. Well, yeah, looks like St. Patrick's Day may be a little cold. I won't. All right. This is the second Sunday of the month. The church board will meet right after worship, uh, across the way in the Seekers class. Uh, Tuesday, March 12th, the UMW is having their group meeting at 9.30 a.m. Every men's Wednesday now, we're going to be exploring the question, what is Methodism? Really looking at a basic Christian uh, catechism, uh, basic Christian beliefs, with an emphasis on uh, Wesleyan notions of discipleship and doctrine. Uh, this uh, St. Patrick's week, we will not have a Crafters, Inc. on Thursday. And then March 14th, that's going to be the parade day. And Sunday, March 17th, I guess, that's actually St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, so the parade's on the 16th. Yeah. Wait. Yes. <laughs> a little further down the line, Tuesday, March 22nd, 26th, another UMW group meeting at 9.30 a.m. And this fifth Sunday, we'll also I'll be having a Sunday fellowship dinner. And also that will be UMCOR Sunday when we take a special conference offering to pay for the administrative costs so that for everyone else who goes in and donates to the causes, you can do that online if you've ever done that. You just enter a number and you give money to a specific relief effort and 100% of those dollars will go to that relieving, to that relief effort because the administrative costs are covered by the church from this offering on this Sunday. And Sunday, April the 14th, that's Palm Sunday this year and April 21st, that's going to be Easter Sunday. Again, a reminder, we're having Operation Christmas Child donations throughout the year. Uh, during March, we're gonna be collecting quality craft items. It could be knitting, sewing, crocheting, uh, no-sew projects, kind of like the just fun sort of homemade stuff. And if you are on Pinterest, Pinterest is a world of, on its own, but if you're on Pinterest, you can go under Operation Christmas Child crafts and I got to poking around and it's a rabbit hole you can go down there's just a jillion ideas of things you can make of every kind of craft and again a reminder of our uh, changed email address and where you can find us on SoundCloud and YouTube Again, I welcome you all to worship, and I encourage you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship as we hear the prelude together. him this morning is he has made me glad it's in your black book on page 2270 and we're going to sing the whole thing through two times so please stand Yes, man. 
made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord to join me in our call to worship this morning, taken from Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgments are like the great deed. O Lord, humans and animals, you say. O God, how precious is your steadfast love. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your salvation to the upright of heart. Our hymn of praise this morning is Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. It's on page 2140 in your black hymnal. We'll sing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5.
You may be seated. Before our time of prayer this morning, uh, I invite all of you to share any joys or concerns you might have so that we could take them before the Lord together in prayer. My mom is, Lana, is doing okay. She's still really tired feeling, so just please keep her in your prayers that she does well. She goes to the doctor on Wednesday. Any other joys or continue? Yeah, uh, Stephanie. Prayers, please, for Chrissy Kane and family and the passing of her husband, Chad. Chrissy? Christy. Christy Kane. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in Wellington. And, and they lost Chad. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there were other joys or concerns this morning? Well, that's a given. <laughs> I knew it. It, it is. It is. Yes. We haven't had much weather here, but in other parts of the country, they've had extreme snow, extreme rain, flooding. It's just. I got a call from my brother in Kentucky. He said the the lakes up there or everywhere just up completely buried and probably washed away his right. sister-in-law's dock and they can't drain the water because they're trying to keep other places from flooding. I have a friend in Colorado that she finally got her mailbox yesterday after I'm home. She didn't even get her mailbox. It's buried in snow. And I don't know how they're paying the heating bills and staying warm and dealing with all Are there other joys or concerns this morning? Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Great God in heaven, and here with us through your spirit, we rejoice in your presence among your people and thank you for the privilege of being called citizens of heaven, the body of Christ, members of one another, a chosen people, uh, stones being built into an eternal temple to bring you honor and praise and glory. We thank you this morning that Lana is doing better, but we ask that you would continue to uh, give her strength to aid in her recovery, to get her back on her feet and back to doing the things that she feels led to do. We pray also this morning for the Cain family for Christy as they grieve the loss of Chad. We know that you understand our griefs, that you wept with Mary at the tomb of Lazarus. For though we have great hope in you, and you have life and death in your hands, though we know that we are never truly lost to one another, still, in the dimness of this world, these losses cause us great distress. We thank you that you are always present with us in them, and we ask that you would especially surround the Cain family with your love, that it might stimulate in them a regard for the gift they have received, though that gift has been cut short. We also pray for our nation. We pray for the forgetfulness of a whole people that has forgotten its roots and its past, that sees you as a wonderful, kindly old grandfather and has forgotten that you still are as much today as you ever were the judge of the nations and that no nation can long disregard you without bringing upon itself the consequences of its own foolishness and blindness. We ask that you would open the eyes of our leaders and the eyes of our people that you would deliver them from the spirit of contentiousness and envy and mistrust that has seized this country. We also pray that you would help deliver those who are suffering from the effects of the enormous amount of rain they're receiving. Be with all the people who are trying to figure out what to do with all the water 
that has been poured on the land. The people at the Tennessee Valley, Valley Authority and all those who are trying to shunt the waters to the sea before they can flood homes. We ask also in this time of need that you would use it not to instill fear, fear but to turn the hearts of neighbors towards one another as this fragile system that we call civilization is seen to be as fragile as it is. Let us remember how much we depend upon one another. That you have created us not just for love, but you have created us and the world in such a way that from time to time we shall be compelled to rely upon one another and relearn the art of trust and generosity, if not from a faithful spirit, then through sheer necessity. Even in your judgments, Lord, you are just. This morning, we acknowledge that our hearts are not pure, that sin is crouching at our door or nipping at our heels. It comes cleverly disguised, enticingly packaged. We hide it from ourselves. We may ask, is my heart stubborn, arrogant, unyielding, pitiless, unforgiving? No, we might tell ourselves, I'm strong of character, firm of purpose, a person of integrity. We are absurdly overconfident in our ability to recognize and resist the seductions of a culture that pursues happiness and despises the way of cross, of the cross and of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for this special season that reminds us to look to you for strength and guidance. Thank you that our identity, our purpose, our meaning is not in the ever-changing whims of the world, but in belonging to you through Jesus Christ, who also taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is It Is Well With My Soul on page 377 of your red hymnal. If you'll stand with me, we'll sing all four verses.
Revelation. God, you reveal the mystery of your grace in surprising ways. Tune our hearts to hear your voice, that we may remain faithful to the ways of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Our gospel reading this morning is Luke 10, 1 through 11, and 17 through 20. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who's, who are there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, Go out into its street and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. And then he said to them, I watch Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. And see, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When Jesus talked about snakes and scorpions, you know, he wasn't talking about certainly just real snakes and scorpions. I know I've heard about in snake handling churches where <laughs> apparently they actually exist. But it is a curious expression. See, I have given you authority to tread. I like the old scriptures where it said, behold. It got my attention more than see. That's sort of like a throwaway word people put in when they're talking and usually it's annoying. See, see. But he said earlier, see, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. And then he does the astonishing thing of telling them to go completely unprepared. Don't take any extra anything. Make no provision from the journey. Uh, don't constantly be worrying about where you're showing up. Whatever house you come to, uh, don't move to another one. Don't jump around looking for a better reception. And if you say peace to the house, then whoever there shares in peace will receive it. And if somebody there doesn't want it, well, then it'll return to you, which means that you'll keep your peace even if that person proves to be a pain in the neck. But when he says snakes and scorpions, he's not just pulling it out of his hat. He's actually making a reference to Deuteronomy 8, uh, 11 to 20. It's a warning God gives to the people of Israel. Deuteronomy, of course, was one of Jesus' favorite books to quote. He quotes it when he's being tempted by the devil, and he alludes to it here. And what happens in that passage is God is reminding the people after they get into the promised land, and they've got all these houses that they didn't build, plants they didn't plant, they're enjoying the fruit of the land, he cautions them. On that day, um, not to exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, an arid wasteland with poisonous snakes and scorpions. It's the only place I could find in the entire Bible where snakes and scorpions appear together. It was God that made the water flow and took care of them. He fed them in the wilderness with manna that, the ancest, that their ancestors had not known to humble them and test them, and in the end, to do them good. And his caution was, don't say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth, the trees, the milk and honey. 
But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth so that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors as he is doing today. If you do forget the Lord your God and follow other gods to serve and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Now when Jesus says, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He's saying, don't look at the power, don't look at what you're accomplishing. No matter how many converts you get or how big your following becomes, don't forget. Don't forget the Lord your God. Don't forget that you serve his spirit and not your own. Rather, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Let that be your whole motivation. Your names are written in heaven, therefore go and expand the kingdom of heaven. That shall be both your motivation and your goal. That shall be what you shall celebrate and not however much power you have. He's telling them, in essence, as we're going through and we're growing the kingdom, he's saying, I'm making a list. I'm making a list of names, not to punish, but names to be written in the rolls of heaven. For the people of that day, that would have meant what being a Roman citizen meant to Paul. Somewhere in this, a city would have a role of citizens. In that day, it wasn't an automatic. You didn't get, become a citizen just by being born there. If this cuts out again, I'm gonna stop and get extra batteries. <laughs> we do need a little power from time to time, don't we? Um, and that's really what Jesus is saying. Rejoice that your citizenship is in heaven. You're listed there. Uh, as I said, cities in the old times, maybe five at max, 10% of the people who lived anywhere were actually citizens and had rights. That gave them privileges and all sorts of wonder thi wonderful things. He's saying your real privilege, the real thing you're rejoicing in that you count on isn't anything that you have down here that you can accomplish. It's what's being prepared for you in heaven. And this is not a small warning that Jesus is giving them. I mean, look at the context. Out of nowhere, apparently, he says, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning in an instant. So fast, it's almost impossible to see. Brilliant, loud, and powerful. Their celebration of the power and authority given to them is not a good thing at all. It's satanic. And in fact, they've done it before. A little bit before this, as they were passing on their way to Jerusalem, that's where Jesus is headed. We've had the transfiguration. He has set his face toward Jerusalem. He's headed to the cross. In Luke 9, 52 to 55, he's traveling and he sends messengers ahead to a village of the Samaritans to make a place ready for him, but the village wouldn't receive them because Jesus' face was set toward Jerusalem. Samaria and Jerusalem, they were at odds with each other. The Samaritans, they knew how to worship. Jerusalem had it wrong. Jerusalem knew how to worship. The Samaritans had it wrong. And they were telling Jesus, no thank you. And James and John heard about it and they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus rebuked them. In the King James Version, there's a few more words added. He said, you don't know what spirit you're of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy people's lives, but to save them. It's, those words don't actually appear to have been in the original manuscript, but it was such a strong note, apparently so frequently overlooked by people dying to judge and see people condemned in the eyes of God for their errors, while they, of course, possess the truth that it was incorporated into the text. But that's clearly what it is. They don't seem to understand what spirit they're of. And frankly, I can't blame them because they know their Bible. They saw all the judgment going on in the Old Testament. And more than that, they've been traveling with and listening to Jesus. Some of the verses that I omitted to make the reading a little shorter were precisely that. Jesus pronouncing a kind of judgment, really a lamentation as opposed to judgment on the cities who had rejected him. Woe to you, Chorazin and Bethsaida. 
It comes right after they shake the dust off their feet. In 12 to 15, he says, I tell you on that day it'll be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. So you can see why they might say, shall we call fire down from heaven? Somehow that's immediately where they want to go. They're, they're all about the power and the authority that's been given to them. They don't understand what's going on. And he cautions Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. And he's saying, woe to you cities, woe to you. Um, I mean, we, I recently did the thing with the emojis where I asked you to imagine how you picture Jesus saying those words. Woe is not being said in anger and judgment like the prophet calling down fire from heaven. He's really sad. He just can't believe that these cities are neglecting so great a salvation and so great an opportunity. And this is the last verse I admitted, and I actually received it just yesterday in as one of the readings that we get automatically through a little devotional that I have emailed to me, it's this one, where he says to them, whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Have you ever heard anyone use that expression in terms of a relationship or somebody they've been trying to talk to, that it's, time, it's come time to shake the dust from my feet? That they're just, there must come a time when you just give up on somebody. We told them the gospel. We told them the truth. They wouldn't hear it. Let's shake the dust from our feet. Well, here's my thought on it that's, I think, an important distinction to know. The disciples know that Jesus has sent them. And they know exactly what he told them to say. So, yes, very literally, if they reject them and what they say, They're rejecting Jesus. They know who Jesus is, these towns. They've heard of him. He's there. You can go meet him, talk to him, touch him, shake his hand. If they reject his disciples, they're rejecting him. They know that to be the case. We, however, can do no better than think that that is the case. Convince ourselves that we know exactly what Jesus wants to do and that we know exactly what Jesus wants us to say. This is not a good idea. Um, You can particularly find this in Jeremiah, chapter 14, verse 14. And the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, a worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. Jeremiah 23, 21. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil ways and from the evil of their doings. That idea of standing in God's counsel, uh, think back of the prophets who give their calling. They actually see God standing in the presence of his angels, Maybe they have a cold touch to their lips, as Isaiah did. That literally means they have a vision of God. And that's why Paul counts as an apostle, because he actually saw the Lord. He stood in his presence, in his counsel, even though he hadn't been with him in his life. But how do we know the difference? When there's so many prophets out there saying so many different things, how do we know the difference? How do we know when somebody has been sent by the Lord or with a message from the Lord? I would think that the only way and the most immediate way we can know is judging from what God has already said. This is, uh, would be a natural concern, wouldn't you think, for seminary students? That's what Charles and John Wesley both were when they went to Oxford, and Charles was concerned because he was acting like all the other guys. Whether, I don't know what he always was spending his time, but he noticed that his faith was kind of, eh, he could take it or leave it. And eventually he and John got together and they began meeting with other people to study the scripture. And they devoted themselves to Bible study, uh, to regularly taking the Eucharist, they were called the sacramentarians. Uh, and also to good works. 
And the United Methodist Women still has that admonition from Wesley, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. And let's face it, the Methodist Church is real good at that. That's been a focus for a long time. It's interesting that Charles and, and John and the other guys visited Castle Prison. The prisoners who'd been set free by the Lord went to visit the prisoners in the prison, and they would do that every week the ironic thing, and maybe it's somewhat appropriate, is that prison, it's not a prison anymore. They've refurbished it into a luxury hotel and restaurant. I wonder how many people when they go into a church are looking for a gathering of ex-cons, of people wanting to get out of prison who've been set free, or they kind of want to see something like a luxury hotel and nice restaurant a place with nice accommodations, good facilities, and good food in the literal sense. Now other people would call John and Charles Wesley's group the Holy Club Methodists, that name stuck because they had a regular method and discipline. And also Bible moths, I liked that one, that's still my favorite one, a Bible moth. Not quite a bookworm, but we know it's definitely related. Bookworms or it's just somebody who's unusually devoted to reading, but it can also mean somebody who just puts way too much of an emphasis on book learning. And considering the way Wesley often challenged uh, his classmates, Charles did, uh, you can understand how they might think, well, you guys are taking all that stuff too seriously and you're not paying enough attention to real life. And it's, of course, obvious why John and Charles and the other people in his group who were all essentially planning to become priests in the Anglican church one day would want to know the Bible backward and forward. They wanted to the best of their ability make sure that whatever they were teaching people was in fact the word of God. That's always been the standard for every Reformation church. A church is a place where the pure word of God is preached, or at least that's the ideal. That I me or any other preacher says as little as possible about what we just think, or if, we, if it's just what we think, we're crystal clear about it, and we try to give our best understanding of what the scriptures actually mean. But it can also be important for everyone. If you go out, and indeed we're all sent, that's why you can quote a lot of scriptures on that, but the fact that he's sending 70 people out is kind of a double illusion. It's to the 70 people that remember Moses got to help him because he was wearing himself out. One person couldn't do it all. And they were to organize everybody into smaller groups. It was to make sure that the word, the laws of God got to every single person in Israel and they didn't constantly come back to him asking him every single question. The 70 is also a reference to the number of nations in the table of nations, after the, the split at Babylon, all the nations of the world formed, there were 70 in that list. So it's referring to the whole world, as though one person were appointed for every nation. This is something that's gonna go global, and it's gonna take everyone to organize it and do it. Now, as I mentioned, Charles and John, they were challenging some of their the other people around Oxford. So another uh, nickname they had was not Bible moths, but Bible bigots. Somebody who inflexibly holds an opinion. They felt perhaps they were being persecuted. But a Bible moth is somebody who, you know, unless we've stood in the Lord's presence, as Paul did on the road to the Damascus, uh, we count the stories, histories, prophecies, prayers, and psalms, the gospels, and the letters. We treasure them, we carefully study them, we humbly interpret them, faithfully follow them, and teach them. That's about as close as we're ever going to get to being in the presence of God. I don't deny that there might be a prophet here or there. I certainly think there probably is, almost certainly. But everybody is acting like a prophet, too many. They just seem to be certain about what they believe. 
In his 37th sermon in the collection of 40 that were kind of standardized as being a doctrinal guide for the Methodist church, that 37th sermon, Wesley writes on the nature of enthusiasm and he says, beware you are not a fire, fiery persecuting enthusiast. Don't imagine that God has called you, contrary to the spirit of the one you call master, to destroy men's lives and not to save them. Never dream of forcing others into the ways of God. Think yourself and let think. That's where that expression came from, think and let think. In fact, the position we're all in is not really that of whoever rejects you rejects me, but more like what, first, what Peter describes in 1 Peter 3.14. Don't fear what they fear. Don't get be caught up in all the things that they're worried about. And don't be intimidated, but in your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. Make sure he's first in your hearts and not the words you think you've understood in a book. Don't worship the Bible. The technical term for that is bibliolatry. Don't set a particular theology above Christ as Lord. And always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Don't become a Bible bigot. Too many claim to be prophets. Why are they so certain? How do they get to that place? Well, some are bookworms not Bible moths. That's just an artificial distinction I make. You know, bookworms, they get out and they eat books. They eat through the pages. They destroy portions of the text, especially books that are older, neglected, and moldy. They tend to feed on the neglected portions. They might eat away a word or a paragraph or whole pages, and in the process, of course, being insects, they understand nothing. And there are many ways in which the wisdom of the world has pretended to eat away at the scripture and understood nothing of it. There are ways in which the understanding of the world has snuck in and said, it shall be the standard of determining where the Bible counts and where it doesn't. It's one thing to question our understanding. Okay, maybe we got the Bible wrong. Maybe we made it serve our theology because we weren't really serving Christ. We were serving ourselves and our hope of being right. And ultimately, prophet just means speaks for God. Somebody who speaks for God. Well, that's what the whole Bible is. It's a record of those who have spoken for God. And I would rather let scripture eat away at the books of the philosophers of the wise of the world than let it happen the other way around. And I would much sooner say, I think but I'm not certain, then if you reject what I say, then the Lord will reject you. I find that kind of appallingly arrogant. If I rejoice in having the truth, rather than in the fact that the Lord has me, that my name is written in heaven, then I'm done for. If I trust in what I believe rather than in Christ, the one in whom I have believed, I might just one day fall like lightning from heaven and never even notice it. How do we know, though, that our names are written in heaven? If that's going to be the center of our identity, well, this is one of those theological things, isn't it? You have to say a certain prayer, and then once saved, always saved. That creates problems with some of the scriptures. Let's take a look at a few of them. It's interesting. Here's Hebrews 10.39. But we are not among those who shrink back and so are lost, but among those who have faith and so are saved. We're saved. 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So we're saved, but we're still being saved? Romans 10, 9. 
Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm saved, I'm being saved, I will be saved. How does that work? Why is it all three? We say this every time we take communion. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died. We have been reconciled with God, we are saved. Christ is risen. Present to the church through his Holy Spirit, we are being saved. Christ will come again. He will save us. In terms of having been saved, it's another past tense. I could only find two of the past tense as much as we like to, it's true, we're saved, but of all the usages of being saved in the New Testament, I could only find two that were clearly past tense. Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Not according to anything we have done, will do, or are doing now, but it's just simply by his grace. First Corinthians talks about the process of being saved. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to we who are being saved, it's the power of God. He elaborates a little bit further on in that same letter. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, that you heard, received, and stand on, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you unless you have come to believe in vain. What would he mean by coming to believe in vain? He's gonna talk about the resurrection. And he's reminding them, if Christ be not raised from the dead, we're of all people most to be pitied. So that's an important thing, to believe in Jesus Christ, not just crucified for our sins, but also raised from the dead. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless. Romans 10.9 says, because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not uh, action and consequence. It's still a future salvation. He elaborated on it back in Romans 5. Much more securely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, that's the are saved, the crucifixion. We will be saved through him from the wrath of God for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. That's why we call it a mystery of faith. The reconciliation isn't a mystery. The Old Testament guys, they wondered how God was gonna pull it off and they had some weird ideas about a militaristic Messiah and some of them missed what God did with Jesus on the cross. That's not the mystery. The mystery perhaps I think is why. Why is it that God saves us, allows us to go through this process of being saved, of struggling with one another, and has us put our hope off to a future glory? Rejoice that your names are written in heaven, kind of puts out of reach the ability to rejoice in anything here on earth. One of the, as you know, the, uh, is it the motto? The mission statement of the United Methodist Church is basically um, make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I, I get that sort of, but I kind of don't like it because it sounds like we're being manufactured as tools to fix a broken world that's gonna pass away anyway, and the only way that one that's gonna remake it is the Lord. Now, if you add it to the glory of God, then I get it. We're there to make disciples. That's actually what Jesus is doing. He's making a list. He's, he's growing the kingdom. He's redeeming souls. And yes, the transformation of the world is a sign. It's a sign and a sort of a drawing point, like when Jesus fed the 5,000. Because some people don't see with the spirit, they just see with the flesh. 
They just see, hey, I'm hungry, are you feeding me? I want the promise of a better life. Even Abraham had to start out that way. God had to promise him real estate and a nation. But Abraham, of course, never saw any of that. Along the journey, he learned that he needed to place his hope in God. All the, the good works that we do, they're love and action, and they're assigned to those who are spiritually anemic, that they can open their eyes to that future hope we're rejoicing that our names are written in heaven. We're sojourners here. That little snakes and scorpion line that Jesus had pointed to the fact that you're on a wilderness journey. I am leading you, you are my disciples. We're not trying to turn the desert into something. We're not trying to get rid of all the snakes and scorpions. I'm taking you somewhere. And that's kind of the ultimate point. But how we know that our names are written in heaven is kind of what we call faith. Paul uh, cautioned Timothy not to be ashamed of the gospel. He cautioned the Corinthians, don't back away from the basic belief that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And in your life, faith, express it as believing loyalty. You not only believe these things, but you're loyal to Jesus, not to the world. You're loyal to God. And not to God as understood through somebody's particular lens, or God as defined by a particular group. So if we've been appointed and sent out, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna be sure? How, how are we gonna do this work if we don't know what we're... Listen carefully to what Jesus said when he set them out. It says, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. This is a uniform experience of those who engage in mission. Just go. Go and start and Christ will show up. It is God alone who can change hearts. It's God alone who can unstop deaf ears and open blind eyes. Christ shows up. The power of the Lord is present. Christ is risen. He is present through his Holy Spirit to his church. And when we go and do these things, he will show up and help us because the work is fundamentally always his. He's the vine, we're the branches. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Believing loyalty to God and not to anything else. So sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts and be ready to give an accounting for the hope that is in you. Just do it with gentleness and reverence. And if you wonder, what is that hope? What shall I say? Hear Jesus in Luke 11. Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be open for you. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Do this every day, all day, and never stop rejoicing that your names are written in heaven. May God bless you and all that you do and all that you say, for he goes with you to bless you on your way and to prosper you in your journey of faith. Amen. At this time, I ask the ushers to come forward and prepare to receive God's tithe and our offering. Let us pray. Loving God, in letting go of these gifts and releasing them for your use, help us to let go of any attempts or inclinations to control your activity in our lives or in your church. We pray for the reign of your free and graceful spirit in our midst. We ask this 
and bring these offerings in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. We'll sing verses 1 through 3. After the benediction, we'll sing verse 4 as our response.
may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good so that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Yeah.